Thank the organizers for inviting me to this in some ways incongruous that I'm here, but I am very interested in attempts to make um, people at one part of a commodity chain accountable from a site that is far off, that is at some other place. That's a strategy that has a considerable history, and much of it is connected to the garment industry. The Ladies' Garment Workers Union uh, in New York City had a terrible tragedy in a high building that contained factories at the turn of the 20th century. A lot of people jumped to their deaths in that tragedy. It led to the first union labeling movement. And union labeling was this early attempt to try to connect consumers to producers to make engagements about what was happening at the point of production so that consumers would be able to make decisions about that. The same regions of New York City that were engaged in those struggles were also engaged, interestingly enough, in the first kosher labeling movements. So the same neighborhoods were trying out the same strategies in very different parts of the community for very different purposes. This is something that comes into us today, uh, right, uh, in many different forms. Consumer boycotts, blockade strategies, certification strategies. A commodity uh, chain of any sort is something that runs from the raw material at one end all the way through to a finished good, like a dress or a t-shirt. Work to transform the uh, flows of material along the chain happen at particular centers of activity that you can call nodes. And much of the restructuring of productive activity across the world in recent years has been about different countries fighting to control and cite different nodes of activity for certain commodity chains. Institutions of all kinds and with all manner of agendas, uh, both within and beyond a chain, will try to seek to regulate and shape the chain at particular nodes. You can see little arrows going into those little blue dots. Firms, occupational health and safety commissions, departments of the environment, NGOs, foremen, managers, trade unions are all examples. Particular institutions, such as states, may wield power over multiple nodes simultaneously, and uh, their influence is transferred also from node to node. But it's interesting to note that institutions of different kinds may not transfer their authority at the same points along the chain. This ensures that different institutions or kinds of institutions will not necessarily correspond in when they transfer their authority over parts of the chain. Incidentally, it's significant when you're using commodity chain analysis that the chain ends with the consumer. <coughs> and there are other frameworks that will go on to talk about the actual consumption product, uh, of the product and its final disposal. Um, this chain analysis is crucial uh, for understanding successful profit making, but it doesn't take into account all the things that you might want in a full life cycle analysis. I'm interested in chains because if you break them down as material things, they are really constructed of multiple flows of different kinds uh, including the raw material itself, the cloth, and so on, money, labor, and even communications. Each flow is channeled along the chain uh, for the product to be produced. The flows can be supplemented, and this is the subordinate arrows coming in and out, by tributary flows in and out of the chain. Control over these flows in and out of the chain is itself a mode of exercising power over the chain. So if you're trying to control capital going in and out of the chain, if you're trying to control uh, access to yarn, to uh, have that yarn integrated into the t-shirt, you can exercise control over that chain. 
interventions are always attempted at one point in order to try and influence activity at another point in the chain. In order to think about that, you need to also consider the fact that each of those flows has to be executed by some sort of transportation or communication technology. Right? Yarn has to be transported, communications have to be transmitted, uh, all these flows have to be mediated in some way, and how those technologies operate actually affects the flows in ways that affect the kinds of power that can be wielded along the chain. The making of the product, therefore, entails wielding economic, social, and political power not only within particular jurisdictions or within a particular firm, not only at particular nodes, but along the chain itself. So power, authority, influence, all classic political science concepts are no stranger just to the operation of the chain. Right? And so it is that countries like Bangladesh are concerned about who's the lead agency and where is it positioned along the chain? Who calls the shots <clears throat> along this chain just to make the product produced? Right? And so uh, specialists will look at the role of contracts and other techniques of management and see how that extends power along the chain. Developing countries are now seeking to try to position themselves <coughs> at powerful positions along the chain to work their way up the supply chain. This is a phrase that you hear a lot in China, and they're trying to get to the more powerful, remunerative parts of that chain. So the chain itself is a context in which politics happen, but it's a distinctive context, and the fact that there is distance involved is absolutely crucial. Chains vary in their capacity to transmit power and other messages effectively along the chain over long distances. And actually, one of the reasons why chains are getting long in physical distance, moving to Bangladesh, for instance, uh, in cultural distance, hiring foreign temporary workers, uh, in institutional terms, multiplying the number of companies that swap material along the chain is precisely to make it difficult to exert accountability along the chain. Distance isn't just physical distance. Cultural and institutional distances also have to be considered. Uh, these dimensions to distance and the distortions that are involved in mediating power moves along the <coughs> chain are some of the main barriers to wielding power effectively along a very long and complicated chain. <coughs> and to think about that with more care, you'd want to think not just about the number of nodes and so on, you'd want to think about the distorting effects of the different media that are transmitting all these different flows uh, and the attempts to wield power by tapping into those flows. The problems of managers, the problems of trade unions, are also the problems of NGOs, uh, certification schemes, and other schemes that are essentially coming from outside the chain to wield power over it. Their strategic issues are the issues that managers and state regulators and foremen also have in trying to control what's going on just beyond their view. Finally, I'd like to point out one other thing about this question of cultural distance. And it leads me away from this metaphor about transmission to think of it more as a problem of translating power. We could talk here about a negotiation between NGOs and, say, Law Blas, Joe Fresh, and it's uh, an unequal relationship, perhaps, but we can sit down in a drawing room uh, and have a negotiated settlement that would change things. But how would it change things? This is important to understanding how that message 
that power message is going to be received in a totally different context. If that power move is translated into a situation where it's being enforced in highly different and much more in unequal situations at the site where it really matters, it will not be perceived in a friendly way. It will be perceived as perhaps an imperial move, as interference from the same people who've been interfering in the lives of people in another country for a very long time. That complicates the problem of figuring out what to do sitting here and trying to influence activity somewhere else. And one thing I'd like to say, just exercising a little extra time here, uh, is to say that the problem of accountability along a chain, the problem of accountability in general, implies that one person is answerable to someone who is further away and has more authority. It means that the person who is answerable is not, in fact, in the central position of power. The workers in these factories are not empowered. And it is because of that that we turn to accountability mechanisms that actually situate power in somebody else's hands. The direct connection between the people who've been injured or the families of those who've been killed and the issues that they face uh, is something that is in some ways written out of the script in the whole conversation about account uh, accountability along the chain. So that is a messy, complicated problem, but I think it's also one that we need to pay attention to. So thank you for your time.